Hello, welcome to this new week uh, where we're going to start the last topic for our hack computer. As you would know that there are few topics which we're going to discuss after this one from our syllabus, which would be not exclusively related to hack, but there would be some computer principles which will be helpful if you're going to take a more advanced computer architecture class, right? So we'll talk about concepts like pipelining and virtual memory and all those things which are there in modern computers to accelerate or paralyze operations. So let's, so yeah, lecture 12 is going to be our last topic in our journey of NAND to Tetris and hack computer. And the purpose of this lecture would be to build the assembler, which should be tied to project six. Again, project six is going to be your last project in the 45% series of assignments, okay? And it would be a software programming competition on Hacker Rank. This competition is just to, for that friendly competition within your peers, but the grades will not be relative. It would be based on number of test cases you're going to pass. So more on that when we release the assignment next Monday, okay? So quick reminders, today, after the class, we are going to open the take-home quiz eight, which would be based on the last week's topics, which is designing a CPU. So hopefully you will have already started implementing the project five, which will be due this coming Sunday, okay? So project five has three chips and the take-home quiz talks about principles from the lecture it might take into account some principles from hack assembly programming, but there will not be any question where you have to decode an assembly instruction per se, okay? But it, as you know, all these topics are interrelated, so there might be some kind of a topic from hack assembly as well, but more, more and more so, it would be based on previous week and your project file. Also, a new thing that would, you would see in the take home quiz is it's just a 30 minute exam rather than 60 minutes. There would be 11 questions for 30 minutes and two attempts. Okay, so it opens tonight at 8 p.m. It would close 8 p.m. tomorrow. Apart from that, uh, we have a final uh, vote. We are going to take the class poll in Thursday's lecture to decide our finals and based on that outcome, we are going to freeze that for everyone and then make a bonus assignment accordingly. How much weightage that bonus assignment has, I would probably announce it when the assignment releases, okay? Because at this stage, I'm not fully certain what that bonus assignment should be. It all depends on your vote on Thursday. So this is a soft vote that we are taking. So out of 38 people, which would I think includes me as well, okay? So I think there are like 37 students probably or 36, I don't know, like- uh, Will we see the results like after the vote finishes? Uh, remind me after the end of the lecture because I will still give it some time for students to like join between in the lecture. But yeah, do remind me like after the lecture to release the poll, okay? But I can let you know what the current status is, okay? And I don't know if that two votes is going to change it because we have a class print of 45 and 38 and 39 is usually what the usual class attendance anyways is. So as for the current poll that I'm seeing, 36 have casted their vote Option two, final exam, 12. Option one, Jack game, 24. So as per soft vote, 67% of you are inclined towards Jack game. So if you are in option two, 33%,
you would probably want to look carefully again and raise your concerns or opinion in the live class forum that is going on, right? The discussion thread. So if this is the trend that I'm going to see on Thursday, okay, please try to like talk with each other in the poll because as for this record, I'm going to go with Jack game as a final exam, but you still have two days to argue your case. And please, please, even if you are aligned to option one, do read all the arguments in the class forum because you don't, you really want to hear what the other side of the story is. And likewise, if you are a person who is going for final exam and you really didn't care about the game, well, if you haven't seen the forum yet, you probably should look at the forum and see what folks are saying about option one and why. Because I would really hope that you guys align towards one option, all right? And the next option would automatically go as a part of the bonus assignment. So look into this carefully and we can discuss it in Thursday's lecture. I'm also keeping track on the discussion forums. It's a good way to actually get some discussion points as well. So please make your opinion heard, right? Any other questions before we start? Oh, there's a chat going on, okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> November 3 election, and I also have this election. Well, I, see, the reason, I hope you are not taking it as, okay, I don't know if I should have given you a choice or not, but I give you a choice because I thought from a student's perspective. Again, I'm going to clear my name from here, okay? This is probably the, probably the first course where you're taking where the final component is in your hand. Right. So the reason, I, I, as I've told you before, is to do whatever it is possible for the students. OK. I did not want to have a say in the final exam because everybody has their own unique situation going with the COVID. And you never know what the situation is going to be during finals, taking multiple exams online for multiple courses. So I really wanted you guys to have a say. And well, um, I just, I just want to say, uh, I don't think you should worry too much about us not appreciating the vote. And in fact, I think most of us do uh, have, it's nice to have a degree of freedom. It's just, you know, it's a, it's a big, you know, fine. It's a big 20%. And I, I think you should think of it more of, we're just taking our grades and stuff seriously. Like it's just a big decision. I see. So yeah, so, so just be careful. I would just uh, close this discussion on this part saying that if you're choosing option one jack game, you should realize that ball is in your court in order to drive how your grades are, right? And then it becomes how good and proficient you are in programming. And if you can be dedicated enough to spend the entire month of November doing that project while juggling other courses and things, right? Just, just be careful on that front. There's, there's nothing I could do to help you midway because I would just ask you to refer to this NAN to Tetris forum. I hope you, those who are aligning for option one Jack game, please, please, please let me remind you again please watch that entire video playlist that we have posted on Project X. Go over Jerry's video, go over the official Nan to Tetris video, which discusses this chapter nine of Nan to Tetris. It might be like, it has like 11 videos, short videos of 20 minutes, 11. In these two days, if you haven't gone so, if, if, if you haven't read it, uh, gone over that video, watch it before actually going for option one because you would want to know what are the pitfalls of Jack and what are the strengths of Jack. It has nothing to do with programming at lower level. It, it is more aligned towards your strengths while you, when you join this course. It's on more on a software programming front. So please watch those videos as a tutorial. See, I told you what the software is. Anyways, it's going towards Jack game. So, I think everybody should watch that series of videos 
before Thursday, if you haven't watched so far uh, yet, before casting your vote. Hey, JD, I have one yeah. more question before we start. Um, so if we do decide to go with the Jack game, um, will we have a discussion post where we can earn participation points by helping other students in the Jack? Like in the you cannot help them write their code. You cannot help them do their project. But of course, just like every project, one commonality that would be there is everybody is using the same programming language. Of course, if you feel that there is kind of a bug and you want, you're not able to address it, and if you see that this is something related to underlying principles of Jack, you can always post that. And who knows, somebody might have fixed that issue in their code, right? That is still an option. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. It should not stop you from discussing. The only thing we say is every project should be unique. And now it would be a tough challenge on your part to propose a project which is unique. And if you are, if you guys are following, I th you guys know there's a project X page up on Canvas, right? Go through that, see what all deliverables we need. Even before starting the project, you need to turn in a proposal with cleared proposed guidelines and everything. And that's the reason we announced this poll and chat last week. So you should really look into that. The, there would be small, small milestones in the month of November. I'm not scaring you guys. I'm actually telling you that what is expected of in option one. Even if it's a three week, close to three to four week project, you would have a kind of a weekly deadlines of something or other. There can be a proposal deadline, there can be a mid progress deadline, there, can, there is a weekly update status report. So apart from coding, there are a lot of writing that you have to also do to share your progress. Then in And then you have a presentation that needs to be made. There needs to be a video recording, this, similar to the playlist that you might have watched about the sample video. So there's a three minute uh, thing. And then there would be kind of grading that we have to do. So please be careful about everything before you make a vote. If you have any concerns, we are going to again, spend Thursday's first 15, 20 minutes asking the questions. And at the end of Thursday's lecture, we are going to take a poll. Okay, so make sure you know everything about Jack game before deciding on it. All right, so that's it for the Jack discussion for today. Everything is on Canvas, look into Canvas and it should be sufficient. Okay, I think we have all the students, so I'm going to end the polls so that it doesn't interfere. So it stands at 24 Jack. 12 final out of 36 students. So option one so far. I'm sorry, repeat the number. Oh, thank you. Okay, sounds good everyone. Okay. All right. Anyone watch the movie 12 Angry Men? <laughs> yeah. reminds me reminds me of that oh you never celebrate too early my friends option one wait 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 until people see you never know <laughs> okay anyways uh other option would go as a part of the bonus anyway so uh not no no don't don't feel that bad okay Okay, stop sharing the results. Back to. Okay, there's an option of relaunching poll as well. Do you want me to relaunch poll after the end of the class to see if this little bit talk has changed the statistics? Let's do a, another poll at the end of the class, right? I just got to know there is an option of relaunching the poll.
Okay, so back to the final leg of our journey. Okay, I'll quickly go over these. Uh, okay, what, what do we have? Oh, project five, right? So project six, that's the last connection that we have. We know, how, know about assembly language, right? Everybody knows how to write in assembly, those fancy A and C instructions. And everybody knows how to convert an assembly to a 16-bit instruction using that reference sheet. Hopefully you should have it printed by now. The whole idea about this topic is to revise some of the assembly programming and try to understand from the perspective of the assembler. So assembler is a tool that you have already used in project four to convert your assembly to machine code or hack code. So I think I reminded this uh, during our assembly talk uh, and lectures that try to comment every line of assembly to understand what's going behind the scenes. If you did that, and if you invested time doing all that for your assignments, it's going to pay dividends here because this would seem so intuitive right now because you have to assume yourself as an assembler who has to read an assembly code line by line, okay? So for this discussion, consider yourself as the assembler too. Okay, so what we will have is there would be an input file like this, which is an assembly, hack assembly. And the purpose of this assembler is to take this input file and create an output file, which is a hack file. Every statement is a 16-bit instruction. And this is that machine code which gets loaded into your ROM as an instruction, right? So that's what the final outcome goes uh, comes out to be. Like when you execute a machine language and whatever the purpose it is, it will work like that. Just to give you a quick overview, you see this high level language here. Can you track my mouse? Hopefully, yes. This high level language is basically Jack. So when you write a program in Jack, if you're going for a project, you simply have to run it through some of the tools that we have. Again, all the instructions are there in Project X. Now, if you run through it through the compiler, Jack compiler and the VM translator, it will directly take you to this step where you would see the screen and then you can play a game on that, which is what your Project X is all about. Okay, or whatever screen coloring you have done so far in project four. Okay, so basically we'll have an assembly file and we want to convert it to a hack file. So topics would be this. Uh, so see, all of this are, is very repetitive, but you need to understand what is it to be an assembler, right? So just take this lecture in that spirit and ask me questions if you are not following anything, right? So you will have a source language given to you and then the assembler that you, would, that you would have coded in project six will take this and output a target language or file. Now the idea is what are the rules of this game? The game means the game of the assembler where you have to convert an assembly to a, a hack file, right? So if you are an assembler, let me not, let, let, let's pause here for a couple of minutes and think, right? Can you guys write it on the chat that when you see this left, left side window, which is an assembly language, and if you are an assembler, which is going line by line, what are the things you need to take into consideration before you convert it to a binary file? Can you guys write it down? Like just use it as, as your like, ideas dump, like labels, cool. Spaces, again, nice. Because think of like every, per, every person would have their own style of writing it, right? Suppose after two statements at I am equal to one, I give a white line, white space before writing at some. Some other person might not do that, right? So you have to take care of spaces, slash n, n line characters, nice. Labels, what else? Semicolon with jump, comments. 
Excellent. Okay, semicolon with job instruction. Yes, Michael, that's an important aspect of identifying if there is a jump or not. What about indentation? Ah, Zachary, okay, spaces, labels, lines, special characters. Why square brackets? Why opening square bracket? Where is it being used in assembly? So I don't agree with the opening square. I agree with the semicolon. I agree with that. Of course, indentation. Uh, the comma isn't it, being used. That was just separating. Yeah, the Julia, perfect. Parenthesis, excellent. Arthur. Oh, that's what I meant to, gosh dang it. <laughs> <laughs> Be careful, okay, Zach? It's what Julia's mentioned, okay? It's a parenthesis. You need to keep track of variables. Perfect, because you know, all these variables are user choice. Arturo, the very fact that's a human convention, the indentation, the assembler has to take that into account because it cannot have a different target, different binary code because a programmer has chosen to use an indentation. So you have to take care of indentation as well. Anything else? I think we have covered almost everything. And I think you guys are now expert in writing assembler, right? So should we end the lecture today? <laughs> Just kidding, okay. So, so it's great that Normal characters, like when you write loop, well, yeah, it's to, it's to do with labels. Julia's and Zachary's recent comment are interrelated, okay? So let me just combine everything and categorize them into what we're going to see next. So as an assembler, you have to take care of white spaces. And when I say white spaces and special characters, see, make a list of all those things we are going to cover. We need to take care of comments. We need to take care of indentation. We, and comments are also, there are two types of comments, right? There are inline comments like at i equal to, like, like i equal to one, sum equal to zero. These are inline comments. And then there are like the, the, com, the natural comments we have like at the very start, right? So you have to take care of both types of comments. You have to take care of indentation. You have to take care of this new line, this line space that you have, right? So all these things would fall under white space characters and everything, right? All these fancy indentations and everything. Now from a program perspective, from the assembly perspective, you need to identify between preserved keywords and the, so see, there's a notion of symbols. And if you remember the symbols were reserved keywords, right? Or the inbuilt symbols. Let, let me not use the word keyword because I remember last time somebody got confused using DM and AS keywords because they are part of the assembly language. Let me use inbuilt symbols so that it clarifies that, okay, it's R0 to R15 screen KBD and whatever we have in that chart, right? So there are inbuilt symbols to be taken care of. There are user-defined symbols, which are called as variables. And then there are these labels, which are used in jump. So there are three different types of symbols to be taken care of, right? And then of course, we have to identify which instruction is A instruction and which instruction is C instruction by looking at the assembly, okay? So how, how would you distinguish between A and C by looking at an assembly statement? That's it. Does it start with at, at symbol or does it not start with at symbol, right? If it starts with at, it's surely an A. If it does not start with at, surely it's not A, but it may or may not be C. So you have to check if the C instruction is syntactically correct or not as well. If it's an A instruction, you have to check if the value is positive or negative because that can be a syntactical error as well. So you have to build that syntactically correct feature in your assembler too. What if somebody writes D equals M plus two, right? 
Now that is syntactically not right. So you have, should be able to identify it. So it's not always that it starts with at. It gives you an indication which track to follow. So if it's a track of C, then you have to see if it's syntactically correct C instruction. So we'll talk all about these in upcoming slides, okay? So we're going to re recap the rules of the source language and target language. Okay, recap, A instruction, at value. Now each and every line here becomes important important for you to see if it's syntactically right or not. So this at value can be a constant, at two, at three, at 20, or it can be a symbol referring to such a constant, like at foo, at end, at loop, at r3. So all these are symbols. And we have three definitions of symbols, inbuilt, labels, and variables, right? And once you identify what the value here is, then it's easy to write the instruction. Since it's an A instruction, it should start with an opcode zero, followed by a 15 bit representation of the value, right? C instruction, your format. So this is one of the formats. Remember, please go over my lecture notes and our slides from hack. Okay, you can follow the slides there. Uh, remember there are in my class notes, I talked about that there are three, four different versions of this statement. Dest equal to comp, comp semicolon jump, and simply comp and then this one. So there are four iterations where comp is compulsory, dest and jump are optional. And if dest is optional, you should not have an assignment operator. If jump is optional, you should not have a semicolon operator, right? So you have to identify what, if it fits the template of C instruction, right? And based on that, you have to fill up this syntax. How do you do that? Well, for comp, there are two categories based on bit A, right? So this A controls this side or this side of the comp operations. So you have to look at this comp. For C1 to C6, you will look at what operation is it. So you should be able to decode it. Then D1, D2, D3 should be like, if you see one of this preceding, see, this is all parsing. If you if remember, there was this pre-course evaluation where you had to talk about, do you know how to work with dictionaries, maps, parsing? Well, these are the things that we're talking about. If you know how to use libraries, it's great. So basically, if you are an assembler or a program, it will read this line, it will try to parse it based on, do I see these delimiters, which is an assignment operator semicolon? If yes, then I would have three fields. This field is dest, so I will compare it to this dictionary. So again, you will have these symbols. So consider this as your reference sheets, which you have to code in a data structure, right? So every time I have a match for M, the code is 001. So it's simply looking into the symbol table or a data structure, which creates that symbol table, and then using this value in the output to replace this comp, right? Similarly for D1, D2, D3, well, moment you find a destination within this, you know it's valid. So these have to be hard coded in a data structure in your code, right? Or a simple table. Similarly with jump, right? Is easy. Any questions so far on what we're trying to do? Which one? Assembler tool, Joshua? You you have you have full freedom to use any language which is there on Hacker Rank. So people have used Python, C, Java. If you know any one of them, you should be good. In my personal experience, I think people have enjoyed using Java and Python because of many libraries. What is coding? Adrian, can you clarify? Speak up guys, let's speak up. Uh, okay. 
well, Zachary, don't give away. <laughs> don't give away the entire project. Yeah, yeah, if you're using Python, just import, import, right? Yeah, so we are not asking you to create libraries from scratch. That's why I think personally, if you're using C++, it kind of becomes difficult, but it's not impossible. If, you, if, you're, if you're confident with your C++ skills, well, you will learn more about C++ when you try to incorporate libraries and it's still doable, right? So let's talk about these predefined symbols. Remember this at value can have a non-constant number, which is a symbol. So this is the symbol table. So these are the predefined symbols. So you have to create a data structure or a dictionary. Dictionary is a kind of a data structure. Map is a kind of a data structure. If you don't know anything about this, well, challenges like this is where you learn new topics. Okay, so do a quick tutorial on how to do dictionaries in whatever favorite programming language you have. And that's how you would create a dictionary or a map of this, right? So, so this has to be hard coded, right? Label declaration. Again, you have to identify if a particular symbol is a label or not. And how do you identify it? Well, you have to read through this entire assembly code and, and identify what Julia was mentioning that do I see parentheses or not? If something is defined within parentheses, then that is a label, right? And what is a variable? Anything which is not in this family and not in the family of labels is indeed a variable. Okay, so see the order. This would be inbuilt in your dictionary. This would be while assembling your program, we are going to identify if it's a label or not. If it is a label, you push it to your dictionary, add it to your dictionary with the corresponding value. What is the value for a label? What is the value for a label? You should know all this by now. Wrong. Sixteen plus wrong. Number the number of the line after the label declaration. Okay. So the value associated with the label on the symbol table is actually the number, the line number of the instruction following this declaration. What is the value associated with the variable name? What is the value associated with the variable name? 16 plus, okay because all this information would be useful when you are populating this dictionary while, com while assembling your program, okay? We'll go more detail in detail. So you probably would have something like this on the left, which is a mix of comments, indentation, inline comments. Then you have these fancy declarations. And remember our first lecture on assembly when we did not know anything about labels, when we did not know anything about inbuilt symbols. So inter instead of I, I would have written at 16, M equal to one. Instead of sum, I would have written at sum, right? Instead of at R zero, I would have written at zero. That is what we learned in our very first lecture before introducing all these fancy concepts to make our lives easy while writing assembly. Well, in this project, you have to go back to the very basic and unravel what are these special symbols you are using? What do they mean in terms of numbers? And that was the reason I was recommending you back then that for every statement, write down what it means in terms of its raw code. If you're using at i, you should make a comment and say, oh, this initializes a as 16, right? Because when you know that it's A is 16, you can identify that what the binary code for that statement is going to be, right? So, so the elements we are looking at is, firstly, we have to take care about white spaces. 
which is empty lines, indentations. Yeah, it's a pattern recognition problem. Yeah, parse and it's like a template matching, if you would say. Line comments, inline comments. It's fun and super easy. Instructions, then identify two types of instructions, A or C. Symbols, now these symbols can be variables or label declarations, right? So the challenges would be to handle these white spaces, instructions and symbols. And once you handle all three, you would have the final hack machine code. Okay, so we'll push symbols for later discussions. Let's start with the usual suspects. How to first clean the code? When I say clean the code, that means remove all these white spacing and something that the assembler does not want to anyways translate. Right, so we'll go into handling white space. So how would you handle the white space and instructions? <laughs> okay, every time you see a yellow box appearing in the slide, that's the solution to how you should handle anything, right? So if you see a comments, you should basically ignore it. That means your file read pointer should go to the next line, right? If you see a comment, you should ignore it. If you're reading something and there's an indentation, you should keep reading that file stream in that line until you reach something that you are looking for. Because every statement is either an A instruction or a C instruction or a label declaration. That's it, right? So you're going to ignore everything else. And also while reading it, the moment you get at 16 and you see a space, you should know that if I encounter a slash, it should be ignored, right? So you should be careful till what part you want to keep reading every line because there can be comments here which necessarily should not go into your code, right? So, so we dealt with white spaces, which is basically ignore it and move to the new line. Now let's talk about instructions, okay? So again, we have seen this. If a value is a decimal constant, simply generate the equivalent binary constant. That means if you are lucky to have something like this in your assembly, that means the programmer is not using any symbols. They are using pure raw numbers with at instructions. It is super easy. You just pattern match at, then whatever value is it, check. Is it number or not? Now you have all these fancy checkers, right? Is num or something like that in a library. Check for a numeric entry. If it is a number, then check if it is positive or negative to see if it's syntactically correct. If it is positive, well, you simply need to take that number and convert it into a binary string of 16. You can write your own code for binary string. That is fine. Yeah, I think so it's is digit in C++. Well, yeah, so yeah, yeah. So, so I'm basically telling you the implementation and it's super easy, so it should not bother anyone, right? So if a value is a symbol, well, we'll push that discussion to later. That means what if you see some characters after at, then those characters, that means non-numeric quantities can fall into three categories, inbuilt symbols, variables, or labels. So we'll talk more about that later. C instructions, I think, yeah, if you have an example like this, MD equal to D plus one, well, first of all, you should identify that it does not start with at, that means it's not an A instruction. Then I think your algorithm should now look for delimiters, which are assignment operator and a semicolon. If it finds assignment, but if the, and it does not find semicolon, then you know that it would be this template, which is dest equal to com. So if you rem remember, I told you that this can be subdivided into three types, dest equals com, com semicolon jump, and simply com. If your C instruction falls into one of these three or this parent category, then you can pattern match all these fields or strings. Right. So if your string is MD, right, find your MD in. So if, 
if you're finding a string which is before assignment, then you know it's a destination. So pattern match that string with one of these eight cases in your dictionary. Whatever is it, 011 is what your these three bits are going to be, right? Then after your assignment, you look for D plus one. So you can keep concatenating, right? You, you have this template, right? If you like parse this template, you keep concatenating the string and finally output that string, that binary string onto an output file. Right? There's a question yeah. in chat, by the way. Yeah, what's the point of just comp? Nothing, but it's syntactically correct, that's why. Right, that comp is just basically calculating the ALU output, right? It has no destination, it has no way to jump, but syntactically it is still correct, even if it's not useful. All right, I have not come across any statement which just uses comp. But as you would know, on a hacker rank platform, we can always have edge cases, right? So there can be some edge test cases where there might be the standalone comp, and there can be this one test case where you keep failing, right? And that can be that one edge case. So as a programmer, you have to take into account all edge cases. And that is what people in interviews ask for anything, right? Have you considered all borderline cases or not? Okay, binary, well, template matching, triple one, it will be triple one because it's the opcode. This one would depend purely on D plus one, all these seven, right? So it will depend on D plus one, D plus one, A is zero. This string again, it is just a lookup, lookup table. So just looking up from the dictionary or lookup table and just filling up those values. Destination, well, the string before assignment is destination. Again, lookup table, MD, zero, triple one. And then finally, J1, J2, J3. Well, your parser did not catch a semicolon. So you already know what these three are. These are null. So null, zero. Okay, looks, should be super easy. Like you guys all come from a little bit of programming experience at minimum, right? And this should be simple, as long as you understand how the assembler should work, right? And if you don't find it easy, talk to me after the class or anytime you have a confusion here, because it should look very intuitive at this stage. So overall assembly logic, again, yellow block, so look into this one, right? This is what your, if you, if you have an assembly code like this, then the job of the assembler is very straightforward. Now the problem is because of our convenience, we have created another layer in front of this, where instead of at 16, we are using at i, instead of at 17, we are using at j or something, right? Instead of at 18, we are using a label here. So our job as an assembler designer now is to like strip away all that user convenient gimmicks we have added so that we get this assembly code, which is straightforward. Because I see, because A instruction is a number here, right? No, no longer a symbol. So, so all that pre-processing needs to be done so that you can come to this step, right? So, if you, so when you will see your project on assembler, you would notice that there are basically two steps in which we are trying to do this project. Firstly, is to work with a symbol-less code. So this is a symbol-less code. That means back to basics, no symbols or anything, pure numbers, right? No comments, nothing. This indentation is okay, it's fine. Probably no indentation as well, right? But basically symbolless means no symbols. Then it has a direct one-to-one -one mapping because you can directly look up the lookup table and then convert it to a binary string. Now in the second, in, in the second pass, or in, if you want to say as a second implementation, so you have to build it in two stages. After, the, after you have completed your this code and it works perfectly fine, at least you know that the moment I have this code, my assembler works just fine because it can look up at the symbol table and convert it. Now then you create a pre-processing part of your code where if there is a symbol in my code, 
how do I go from a simple code to a simple less code, right? So you're solving it like in a backward fashion. Work from here, then add a functionality in your code which can take into account symbols in your code. Is everybody following? Let me know if this part is not clear. Okay. So for each instruction, parse the instruction, break it into its underlying fields like dest, com, jump, or a in an instruction. Now for a instruction, translate the decimal value into binary because in a symbolless code, a instructions is always going to have a value. So you simply translate the decimal into binary. For each C instruction, for each field, that means dest, comp, and jump, generate the corresponding binary code, right? Then assemble all the transfer binary codes into a complete 16-bit machine instruction, right? And then write the 16-bit instruction to the output file. So when we say assemble, that means you're basically concatenating all the fields, right? Whatever it is, and then finally write all these 16 bit instruction to the output file. Right? So this would be the resulting code, the overall assembly logic, right? It's an A instruction, it's a C instruction, A, C, A, C. Similarly, you would see all these output files. Again, a reminder this code does not contain any symbols. So your first target in project five would be to code something like this the first layer. Now, after that first layer works just fine, now think of cases where somebody might have a assembly code with symbols. So Nicholas, uh, your question is more justified to our next topic where how do we take into account symbols? So far, so far in this code, remember, there are no symbols. So R, there is no R0, it has to be at zero. So if you create a code which works on a file like this to convert it into this one, then to take care of R0 that you have asked, we'll now dive into our next topic. So would it be fair to say that there's like a order of operations when you do this, like before you convert this into that uh, or the assembly into the binary if you want to like get the uh the symboled version you'd have to convert that into a decimal format and then do what yeah do so, what you so see, we are anyways letting you know what is the best way to debug your code is to build your code in this fashion because rather than spending all your time creating a full-fledged code which works on any assembly file, break down this process into easier chunks so that it becomes easier for you to debug. And this is what we are proposing, the easier chunks, like chunking your design process. The first part is make, a, make an assembler which works on this symbolless code because this will ensure you that is your parser working? Is your value to symbol comparison in your symbol table working? Because when you say at 16, you should know that, okay, so the 16 should be able to, you should be able to identify that it's a number and should be able to create a binary string. If it is JGT, it should be able to compare the string JGT on the reference sheet, the whatever the inbuilt, lookup table is. So this will ensure that at least that process is right before you incorporate the symbols. And that's why you can debug your code systematically. So this is just an implementation hint. Okay. Thank you. Sure. So now after that first layer is coded, now you have to expand your code to take into considerations. What if my code has symbols, right? Now, this is what a proper code or full-fledged code looks like. Because as an assembler, you should be able to take all these cases as well. So now we have to design some rules to take into consideration what if we do not have 
number after add. What we what if we have all these symbols? Okay. So let's dive into symbols. So everything highlighted is a symbol, and it's mostly to do. It's always to do with an A instruction, right? So your A instruction would look like something like this: at I add some somewhere in your code, you would have a parenthesis. Inside that, there would be a string. This string can be uppercase, lowercase, does not matter. As long as something is defined within parentheses, it becomes a label, right? So you have to identify a label versus a variable versus inbuilt symbol, right? So this is what we want to show, right? There are some predefined symbols, which we call as inbuilt symbols. They represent special memory locations like R0, R1, R2, screen, KBD. Then there are label symbols, which represent destinations of go to instructions or jump instructions, right? So wherever the declarations have been made, that line number. For example, what is the value associated with loop? Because loop is a declaration, right? So you have to count one, two, three, four, then five. Sorry, zero, one, two, three, four. So value associated with loop is four. That means anytime I see at loop, it basically means at four. So that's what your assembler should be able to do. Add this loop onto the running dictionary or a symbol table and associate a value four with the loop so that anytime in my code now I see at loop, my parser should be able to identify that it's not a number, then does it exist on the symbol table? Then when it looks at the symbol table, it will see a number four next to the loop. So simply replace loop with four. Now this becomes at four. So you simply write a binary code for value of loop, right? Yeah, yeah, it starts with zeros, it's four, that's fine. Right. And similarly for this instruction variable, it starts with 16 plus. Okay, so the hack language has 23 predefined symbols. Even if you have not used the right hand side, but do incorporate this because the test files may or may not have this, right? So these are 23 predefined symbols. You can create a dictionary or a map in your data structure, right? And anytime you have this, where this symbol is present in this predefined symbol table, you simply replace predefined symbol with its value and run that convert to binary function on this value. Why would you need two symbols for zero? SP is a stack pointer. We did not cover, we did not cover the virtual machine part of this lecture. So it's to do with push and pop operations. This is a fun course, let me tell you. Like, like given an expression A plus B, like push A on the stack, push B on the stack, then pop the stack and add A plus B. Uh, so, so in that case, we used to write VM codes as well, which is a layer above assembly. So those had these values as well, okay? So where is the symbol table located in the computer? It's not, it's a part of your code that you have to create. So whosoever created that assembler GUI, it's, it's what is a GUI? It's basically a graphical user interface for a code, right? So that code has an inbuilt data structure where this is like recorded. So all this reference sheet that you have has to go as a symbol table, as a data structure in your code. Right, so I'm using these interchangeably like lookup table, symbol table. Symbol table is a concept, lookup table is a concept, data structure, dictionary and maps are a data structure to implement these concepts. Okay, those are proper coding terms. Labels, how do you identify labels? Declared by this command parenthesis. So this directive defines symbol to refer to the memory location holding the next instruction in the program, right? So starts with zero, loop is four. So as an assembler, you have to keep an eye for all the declarations. That means we have to keep an eye for all the parentheses. Loop, stop, end. The moment I identify that there are three parentheses, I should push them onto the dictionary or add them to the dictionary, 
where we need to associate a value with this loop. So this loop would have a value of four, stop will have a value 18, end will, val will have a value 22. So once we read this and add them to our symbol table or dictionary, then anytime I'm using the same strings after my at, I can look up on my symbol table and know what the value associated with those are, right? So loop is four. So anytime I'm using at loop, it means at four. That means always jump to ROM of four, right? So loop has a value four, stop has a value 18, and has a value 22. There you go. So what do you do? So, so the assembler finds these label declarations, identifies what the value of the next line is. It's simple counter, right? And then adds that value as a symbol value pair or a key value pair in your dictionary, right? Now symbols. So any symbol appearing in an assembly, which is not in predefined, that means it is not part of the inbuilt symbol. And, and if it is not defined elsewhere using this symbol declaration, it will be a variable, right? All right, so, uh, so each variable is assigned a unique memory address starting at 16. So it goes line by line. The moment it sees something which is not, a sim which is not an inbuilt symbol, it is not a label declared symbol, then it surely has to be a variable. So it adds it to the symbol table I with the value 16. Then it goes to the next line, identifies it as a C instruction, converts it into a binary. It goes to add some, well, this is not a number. It is not a label because I do not see it on the symbol table yet. So this is something new. So let me push it to the symbol tables as sum, and the next running value is 17, right? And when I go to this at I, well, is I in my predefined symbol table? No. Is I in my label? No. Is I in my variable symbol table? Well, yes. So I will not add I to the symbol table. I will simply use it directly from the symbol table. That's how we ensure that once the once it is declared, it will always going to be mapped to RAM 16. So every time I use at I, it basically means at 16. So this is at 16, at 16, at 16, at 16. Well, Nicholas, wait for it. Yes, we basically have to do two passes of the code, All right? So I'll talk more about that, right? So what's the time right now? Oh, we still have 15 minutes, great. So how do you translate variable symbol? Well, this is the logic. If seen for the first time, assign a unique memory address, which is the running value from 16 plus and add it to the symbol table, right? If it is not, well, so when you say assign a unique memory address, well, assign a unique memory address and add it to the symbol table. If it is not seen for the first time, simply look up at the symbol table and replace this with this address, like whatever the value is, just like previous two, right? So it's a multiple if else things that you have to take into consideration. So look into this one, it's, this is an example. Initialization of the symbol table with all the predefined symbols. Okay, this is easy. Even before reading any new file, assembly file, this is inbuilt in your code. Now your file pointer is going, right? In the first pass, Nicholas, here is your answer. In your first pass, you are basically identifying all your declarations. That means you're looking for opening and closing parentheses, reading the value inside that parenthesis and adding it to the symbol table. So uh, I, have a, I have a question. Yeah. So um, let's say hypothetically, you made a really arbitrarily long amount of symbols wouldn't it eventually just cause issues because then it would be start filling key or sc key screen and keyboard, correct? That is practically not how everyone could. Your screen mapping starts at 16,384. Yeah, I know. I'm saying like if you made like a really arbitrarily long amount of symbols. Yeah, so th that's why there is a notion of virtual machines, which we did not cover. But the virtual machines gives you a perspective that, so I think we get, no, we're going to study this in virtual memory in upcoming 
uh, topics where it gives you an illusion of having an infinite RAM precisely for your doubt. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. As thank you said, you. Physical memory is limited, but as a programmer, everything is given a kind of an illusion that you have infinite memory because there's some kind of layering that is happening, which decides when to add it to the RAM. Yeah. So we used to cover that in virtual mem uh, machines topic. If you see that software, the, the Nano Tetris journey, that is actually something that is done in the software side, like the OS virtual machine. They try to work together to give you that illusion. All right. Good question. So in the first pass, we add these symbols to it and then associate the line number of the instruction just after it, because as you know, label declaration themselves are not instructions. So they don't have any line numbers, right? And in the second pass, well, now you know which, now you know that which ones are variables, because now if you see something fancy after act, you look into this symbol, which was this, right? And you will find that this I is not in the symbol table. So now I is a variable, J sum is a variable. So you get those get added in the second pass to the symbol table. And to resolve what the value associated with the symbol is, look up its value in the symbol table. Because all these symbols are being used where? In A instructions. So now I have a value. So I simply need to convert these value into their binary 15 bit binary strings for those A instructions. So this is the overall process. Again, yellow block box. Initialization, construct an empty symbol table and add the predefined symbols to the symbol table. Predefined symbols are inbuilt symbols, R0 to R1, that stack pointer, LCL, keyboard, everything that you have known. Then the first pass, scan the entire assembly program. For each instruction of this form, add the pair label comma address to the symbol table where address is the number of instructions immediately following this declaration. So, so when they say instruction, it is either A or C instruction following this, right? Second pass, initialize sum n to be 16, which is a counter. Now scan the entire program again. That means the file pointer is reset to the start of the program, scan the entire program again. And for each instruction, if the instruction is at symbol, look up the symbol in the symbol table. If symbol value is found, simply use the value to complete the instructions translation. That is, it's an A instruction. If it is not found, that means that symbol is a variable. So add this new symbol and N, which is a running counter 16 to the symbol table and use N to complete the instructions translation and then N plus plus, because who knows while you are scanning it for the second round, you might see another user defined variable. So that N is automatically waiting at 17. Now that is all to do with add symbol A instruction. But if the instruction is a C instruction, that means if it does not start with at, complete the instructions translation because the C chart is direct, right? You don't have any symbols to interfere your C instructions. And finally, write the translated instruction to the output file, right? Any questions here? So are we not able to do like the first pass and second pass together or is this just a simple Our code should run through the program twice, should run through the assembly file twice. Does that make sense? Are, are label and symbol lookups in the same dictionary or in separate dictionary? Well, you can use the same symbol table, does not matter. You can have the one data structure which keeps, uh, you keep adding a key value pair. So you start with an empty symbol table, then you add the predefined symbols to the symbol table, right? So this is all initializations, hard-coded, right? 
And then every time you read a new pair, you add it to the existing symbol table. It's up to you. You can e see, otherwise you have to look into all the three symbol tables to identify if something is there or not, right? Because you have to go through every key and understand if it exists or not. If it exists, what is the corresponding value? If not, insert this pair into the symbol table. Implementation is like up to you. If you want to create three symbol tables or one symbol table, it's up to you. Right. So, so basically now this goes unsaid because you're coming from a programming background. So basically it's all about reading and parsing commands, converting mnemonics into code and then handling symbols, right? So start reading a file, like design a constructor. Now all these are like implementation hints. You can follow this or you can design based on your knowledge, but yeah. You can have a constructor for a password object that accepts a string specifying a file name and need to know how to read these text files, right? Then move to the next command in the file, like you have to like use a file pointer to read through the file. Then think of it that how do you check the end of the file, get the next command, right? So you can create a, again a function or a method to go to advance on the next command need to read one line at a time, okay, need to skip white skips. So these are the point of, like things you have to keep in mind while designing your assembler. Get the fields of the current command, right? Identify what kind of command is it? Is it A command, C command, or a label declaration? Then easy access to the field, see how they are like breaking it apart. Delimited, equal to, semicolon, right, sum. So yeah, so I think this should be straightforward. You should have, a function which can detect a destination and convert it into its binary, three-bit binary form. It could, should take comp and convert it into a seven-bit string, A and C1 to C6. Jump bits, again, three bits of jump based on this, right? So this is, this should make sense, right? This is just implementation, hence, even if I don't give it to you, based on your knowledge, you could have still done it. So it's just additional things just stating there, right? There you go, right? It's just one way of doing it. Even if you do not follow this, it's still fine because all these are implementation specific. Now, now at this stage, you don't have to worry about what the symbols mean because for the assembler, it's just a pattern matching, like locate a value here, pick up the address, convert it to a binary, binary string, right? Create a new MPS table, add a pair to the table. Does the table contain a given symbol? What is the address associated with the given symbol? So I think this should be intuitive, right? I don't see a lot of things that I need to discuss more, right? This is how you distinguish between labels and variables. The reason we have pass one is to identify labels because you see when we use something right at sum, you don't know what the sum is. Is it a label or a variable? Now, because you had a pass one where the labels were identified by this template, you now know that if sum is existing in the symbol table before pass two, then that sum is a label. But in my pass two, if I find a symbol which is not there in the symbol table, then it is surely a user defined value, which will fall into this one. And you will start using 16, onwards the address, right? So you can read through this based on your comfort level, okay? They have given you some ideas, but in my opinion, follow this if you really do not know anything about programming, because this gives you clear cut things of how you have to do. Otherwise programming for me is very intuitive because if, if I were a student like you and if, if somebody gives me these things, I will probably do the implementation from my intuition first, and then come back to this and check if I have incorporated everything just to be careful. Because you don't want, because programming is again creative. 
creativity, right? So you already know how you would want to implement something. Just go that, do that by intuition. Your most intuitive implementation is the best implementation to start with. Then if there is some error there in your code implementation, come back to these set of slides where there are like hints on implementation, right? Even if you don't want to use constructor and all those things, that's still fine. You don't have to create an object oriented programming to do this. So if you're not comfortable with oops concepts, you can still do this project, right? So I think that's it from my side. I can just quickly show you, you can always come back here, right? So yeah, this test program here and there is basically showing you. So you will see there would be some test files, right? And it would have something similar to this one. See the symbolist version, see the usual one. So here there are no symbols, right? With labels, without labels. So, so yeah, so try it out once the project gets released. But yeah, for the time being this week, focus on finishing your project.